Welcome to a modern nonprofit podcast powered by the Charity CFO, your compass for creative solutions and running your nonprofit. I'm Tasha Anderson, your host and guide through this nonprofit maze. From fundraising to volunteer management, we've got your back. Join us each episode for fresh game-changing strategies that can make a real impact. Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of A Modern Nonprofit Podcast. I'm Tasha Anderson, your host. Today, we're going to be talking about things a little bit different than I think we normally talk about, but something I think all of us can relate to. So I have a new friend, as I do each week, or each episode, I should say, Dimple Devalia. Dimple, you are the author, but also founder of, well, you do a couple things. You are the author of a book that's coming out, Tell Me My Story. But all of your work is really centered in this conversation of, I read it on your website, which is roots in the cloud. I love this phrase right on your website. It says, imagine what might be possible if you could serve others without sacrificing your own mental health and well-being in the process, which I think is so relatable for everyone that's in the nonprofit space. And I was super excited to dive into this conversation. But before we do, I guess I should just thank you for your time and for coming on board. So thank you, Dimple, for joining us today and having this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Well, the most obvious question to me, which I oftentimes do, sometimes I wait till to, to later on, but when people have a very interesting story right out of the gate, I like to ask, tell me a little bit about your own story and what, read, what led you to write this book on the trauma that you experience or the mental health suffering that you might be experiencing while doing kind of humanitarian social work um, or just trying to make the world a better place. Tell me a little bit about your background to set the stage for this conversation. Yeah, of course. So I spent almost 20 years working at, I call like the crossroads of the government and humanitarian sectors, Mm. um, interviewing asylum seekers and refugees. And so 12 of those mm. years were in the field, actually mm. um, doing the work and sitting face to face with people and hearing their stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other eight or so were in different like leadership positions, things like that. And uh, it was it was interesting because when I first started out my career in general, I, I actually came out of law school and worked at the attorney general's office in Denver. Mm. Mm -hmm. And at that time, most of our cases uh, revolved around abuse and neglect type of issues Mm -hmm. because we were representing the State Department of um, Human Services. Mm -hmm. And I had a really great boss who understood the impact of this kind of work on -hmm. on our health and well-being, especially our mental health. And Mm -hmm. so he used to have us go through a uh, a vicarious trauma training. And mm. I didn't know that term at the time. And I remember as a brand new attorney, I was like, why do we need this? I'm fine. Like I can, I can do this work. You know, I don't, sure. I, don't I don't need to talk about this. Um, and what's interesting is it planted a seed though. And a full mm. 10 years later, I was on assignment in Zambia um, interviewing. It was one of the worst um, trips I'd ever been on. At that point, I'd been mm. doing this for a while. And uh, we were interviewing the last of um, the Rwandan genocide survivors. Mm. We were interviewing um, uh, Congolese applicants. And the Congolese yeah. cases are really horrific. Mm. Um, and then we were interviewing what are called protracted Burundians. So these were people from Burundi who had been born into refugee camps. And then the camps had subsequently been attacked. So they were like refugees twice over. Wow. And it was the first time in my career that I was sitting face to face with people. Up until then, I had taken a lot of pride in what I'd called, I like, I'd created what I call, like a, I called it a wall of professionalism. And I think many mm. of us in these fields have this wall that allows mm. us to do this work, right? Sure. But, um, but I, I was just um, in these interviews now and I couldn't control my emotions Mm. Um, I was really struggling to um, to take in everything that they were saying and when I'd leave work um, you know I was I was definitely drinking a lot more I Mm -hmm. was really struggling to go to sleep and if I did sleep I was having really horrific nightmares where I was reliving the trauma that I had you know heard about that day Mm. and so it when I got back from that um, trip, I was 
just say, I said, you know, something feels wrong. Like, actually, I, I realized that on the trip that something is not mm. right. <laughs> uh, but when I got back, I started kind of looking into it a little bit more. And, and I had that light bulb moment of, I think I've heard about this before. And it reminded me of this term vicarious trauma. And when I looked it up, I was like, okay, I'm experiencing all of these things. The mm. problem is that, you know, in our organizations, there's still such a stigma around mental health. And yeah. especially in the government where you have security clearances and stuff like that, there's so much uh, misinformation about what it means to, to get help, right? right? And so I felt very much like I have to do this on my own. I have to try to figure out what's happening. I have to try to heal myself because mm -hmm. I can't talk to anybody. Right. And Along with that was also a lot of shame because mm. there was this feeling like, oh, everybody around me seems to be doing fine. So there must right. be something wrong with me. Like what's wrong sure. with me that I can't handle this work? And so it took me a little bit of time. And as I sat with it, I started thinking about the fact that it it can't just be me. The others right. have to be struggling too. We're just not talking mm -hmm. about it. And mm -hmm. so that kind of led me on this journey of, of really starting to advocate from within my organization um, about the need to normalize these kinds of what I call occupational traumas that yeah. are a very real part of serving humans, right? So mm -hmm. we talk about how being human is messy. And then I say serving humanity is messier. Yeah. yeah. And so these kinds of occupational traumas are really just such a, a real part of the work that nobody talks mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to start um, putting names to what we were experiencing and also letting my colleagues know like, hey, if you're experiencing this, you're not alone and there's something wrong yeah. with you. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of pivoted within my organization and really started focusing on workforce health and well-being um, mm -hmm. and really starting to bring some of these concepts to light and um, trying to help our workforce understand some of the, the kind of things that they could do to help themselves. Mm. But what I started to realize, and so this is where the book, so my book is, I call part memoir, part, part manifesto, okay. because, um, you know, this was my story and what happened. But I eventually hit a wall because I realized that so much of this concept of our health and well-being is placed on the individual, right? So even mm -hmm. if organizations are offering, you know, a mindfulness training or mm -hmm. an extra day off or, or whatever, it's still up to the individual. And I really think that our organizations, these mission-driven organizations actually owe um, a duty of care to their staff. And mm -hmm. you know, duty of care typically is like, you know, our physical health and safety. But I, I think that sure. there needs to be more looking at the whole person. So that's kind of how I ended up here uh, doing this work and really advocating for, um, you know, normalizing that this is what we contend with. You, you, you just said something that I, I don't know why I've never considered because, you know, I've spent 20 years working in and around nonprofits of all different missions. But certainly almost in all cases would have a bit of this mission driven occupational trauma that, that you reference in your book. And it's so fascinating. I work with a lot of veterans organizations too. Right. And I think we've normalized like the outrage that all people have for why is the VA not doing more to support the mental health of our veterans. But I guess I've never thought about the duty that you said that, you know, that these, organizations that do other humanitarian work that has that, you know, occupational trauma is a great word, I'll just use that, uh, for the staff that are serving those that are on kind of the front lines that are, you know, interacting with these really difficult situations, there's no, you know, there's no, um, I, I've not really seen any support in that way. No intentional support, I should say. Yes, you know, we, we offer health insurance and, you know, you can find a provider for mental health services. And, you know, like you said, you know, uh, take your PTO and, and, you know, whatever, take a bubble bath and, you know, whatever, <laughs> go for a walk during lunch or these like little things. But, you know, I, it's, it's fascinating to me um, because I used to be an, an, an administrator of a nonprofit that dealt with some really significant um, occupational trauma. And it's really, um, I don't know, really just something to think about that what should we be doing as an industry? And what should that look like? So kind of dovetailing into that, 
Talk to me maybe some about, I know you've worked with many organizations, many people that have done this kind of work. What are some kind of themes or examples of this mission-driven occupational trauma just to really kind of drive this home for people that may not have thought about it this way? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think I I get really irritated sometimes because everything is lumped under this umbrella of burnout, right? Mm. Everyone is burned out. And People mm. are burned out, but I think it's more than that, right? So burnout is a very specific type of occupational trauma. It's, mm. um, you know, when it's like this prolonged physical and psychological exhaustion that's specifically related to our work, right? So it is yeah. a pretty wide umbrella, but right. But I think especially in these kinds of mission-driven organizations where we're, we're su- um, serving other humans, there's like some additional things that aren't you know burnout you can find in any industry really right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, oh, yeah. I, and i and i do want to clarify that when i say humanitarian i'm talking about anyone who's in the mm-hmm. the business of alleviating pain and suffering in the world so you know we're right. talking medical professionals we're talking sure. about first line um, or frontline workers um you know like there's there's so many different people who fall into this group but mm-hmm. so in addition to kind of the more general forms of trauma, I think humanitarians also experience things like vicarious trauma and secondary traumatic stress. So mm-hmm. these terms are often used interchangeably. They're very similar, but they're different mm-hmm. in that they both um, they both are exactly what I described of my experience, right? Where we are exposed to somebody else's trauma and we start experiencing um, symptoms of that trauma, even though we didn't actually experience it. So we're mm-hmm. taking on another person's trauma. Vicarious trauma is what happens um, over time. So you mm-hmm. are doing this work for a while and it's building up. That's vicarious trauma. Mm-hmm. Secondary mm-hmm. traumatic stress, however, can happen from a single incident. Mm-hmm. And so you could have one incident that leads you to experience these almost like post-traumatic stress mm-hmm. symptoms, right? So that's kind mm-hmm. of the difference there. Um, But then the other, you know, compassion fatigue is a really big one. So compassion fatigue is where we hit our wall, like we just have Mm -hmm. nothing left to give. Um, And we were, you know, I I have a new podcast out called Service Without Sacrifice. And Mm -hmm. it's like a limited series podcast. And this week, we were talking about this idea of compassion fatigue. Mm -hmm. And the flip side of it, which is compassion satisfaction, right, that, you know, Compassion fatigue comes because we are giving so much of ourselves in our work. But there's also this idea of most of us who go into these lines of work, we genuinely love the work. We love this idea of serving others. And there are points in that where we actually feel good, you know, when we're in that interaction. And that's this idea of compassion satisfaction. Um, And then the other big one, and this is the one where I operate in a lot, is moral injury. And Mm -hmm. I think that people are experiencing moral injury um, far more than just typical burnout, but we don't know that or we're not acknowledging it. And moral injury is the the impact of, you know, when our values don't align with our organization's values or, you know, when we're Mm -hmm. asked to do things that go against our own very deeply held morals and beliefs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in this culture, especially, I mean, we see a lot of that. And what I find really interesting (laughs) is that most mission-driven organizations that are in this business of serving other humans have this ethos of care. And yet that ethos of care is often not extended to the people actually doing the work, Mm -hmm. right? And so we see in these um, organizations that moral injury is actually a really big issue because people feel Mm -hmm. so conflicted at times with the mission of service and, you know, what we're trying to do um, and then the ways in which we're being asked to do it. And so there's there's a conflict sometimes in how that's happening. And so, um, yeah, so I think like those are some of the big ones that... Uh, come to mind. But I I do want to say that these are on top of, uh, you know, other traumas that we're experiencing. So we have, you know, big T traumas, little T traumas. So big T traumas are like those, you know, natural disasters. They're, Mm -hmm. you know, the big acts of violence, things like that. 
Uh, but then we've got little t traumas, which are ongoing stressors like poverty sure. and chronic abuse, discrimination. There's like right. a whole host of things that um, there's been a ton of research that shows that these little t traumas as they accumulate mm -hmm. are actually um, as bad or even worse sometimes than the impact of a big T trauma. And so it's important to keep in mind that, you know, on top of these kind of occupational traumas, we have all these other things we're dealing with too. It's, it's so hard for me in this point of the conversation to pick which <laughs> all of these things are so interesting that you want to talk about. I'm like, oh, yes, I can relate to that. Oh, yes, yes. Um, the thing that sticks out to me, too, I, I love this idea of moral injury. And I think to some degree, I, I don't know, I would imagine I'm not the only one, but certainly when I've made the decision to leave sometimes past jobs, it's because of a bit of that moral injury. It's just you know, hey, high level, we uh, can agree on a lot of things. But there's some of those key points that there's just some philosophical differences that I can't quite um, reconcile. So you talk about that, um, this moral injury, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about that. And specifically, because it is related to the workplace, how it shows up in the workplace, and how do people handle that? And I, I say that through the lens of Obviously, I was an employee, certainly, um, at numerous places. I was also an employee and an administrator of a nonprofit that did work that would kind of fall under this camp that we're talking about that certainly had staff that I know spoke up and um, had some of the, um, the different traumas that you've talked about just based on the work that they were doing. And now as an employer that while I have a team of accountants, but, you know, as you had mentioned, it, it, there's trauma in people's lives everywhere, right? Not necessarily related to their work, but that they, it's part of who they are and they bring to work. And so we try to create a culture that's really sensitive to that. And I'm always fascinated by finding that intersection of, you know, how to support employees, how to heal from some of that, or how to support employees that frankly have come to work for me because of some of the stuff they dealt with working in the nonprofit space um, to create some of that separation and how to just how to do all of that. So I'm I'm being very patient, but <laughs> I want to unpack that a little bit more with this idea of moral injury, going back to my initial question. How does it show up in the workplace? And just how do we start kind of healing from that as as we kind of shift the conversation specifically the work the workplace can do? Yeah, that's a great question. So moral injury um was traditionally associated with the military, right? So it was mm -hmm. um associated with soldiers who were coming back from um, conflict zones. And so mm -hmm. when you think about in the midst of war, the things that you're asked to do, it was mm. very deeply conflicting for a lot of people, right? And so right. that's where the term was actually coined. Mm. Um, <clears throat> we've seen this idea of moral injury and moral distress come up a lot through COVID, especially mm -hmm. in the medical profession. They are talking about it quite a bit now because, sure. um, you know, in in hospitals in you know doctors and nurses and others um you know the decisions they were having to make about people you know like who who's going to get this ventilator or who's going you know right. those kinds of things um asking you know for especially for leaders asking staff to come in and work with no PPE or mm -hmm. uh, not enough PPE or so there were like mm -hmm. a lot of things like that that were really um impacting people deeply and then on top of mm -hmm. that there was the the vicarious trauma of you know noticing or not not or even like the secondary traumatic stress of um uh, you know people dying without mm -hmm. having family around right. um and at the same time they were constantly being like yelled at by people and um you know they were the face of everything and so right these family members who were grieving and, you know, scared and their, their way of taking it out was on the medical professionals. Right. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. there was a lot of moral injury in that space. Um, and so again, it's this um, internal conflict that we feel when our professional duties don't align with our personal values. And so mm -hmm. it comes up in the form of a lot of like ethical challenges um, challenges to our integrity when there's yeah. question, uh, questionable practices going on in the organization. Um, and the thing that is interesting to me is that, you know, um, a lot of people talk about 
all the good that came out of the Industrial Revolution, right? And mm -hmm. to me, the legacy of the Industrial Revolution is that, you know, they the idea was to create efficiency, right? Mm -hmm. And so, which is great for, um, you know, when you look at um, kind of like factory jobs and things right. where you're building like widgets or building whatever. Building cards, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So yeah, we want some standards and, and whatnot to make things more efficient. The problem is that was applied across the board. And so all these metrics that have been put into place in a lot of organizations don't factor in the fact that these are human beings who are right. doing this work and they are interacting with other human beings. And mm -hmm. so there's there's these things, you know, the, this idea of the things that um, bump up against our values, this is a very real part of doing mission-driven work. And mm -hmm. it's something that isn't really taken into account. And so for leaders in the context of moral injury, you know, they there's a, a need to create cultures that value um, kind of open communication about ethical mm -hmm. issues. Um, there needs to be a, a lot more transparency in how we make decisions and yeah. why certain choices are made. Um, and then also just a recognition that, hey, uh, I always, you know, like, I really think that if we could do this when people are onboarding, you know, like start right. having these discussions right up front um, to say, like, these are some of the things that we've seen people in this line of work encounter. Mm -hmm. And we want you to know that if you do, you know, come talk to us where, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with you if this is what you experience, mm -hmm. because <clears throat> we all have in the book I talk about like our shaping stories. So the things that have happened in our lives, you know, starting in childhood that mm -hmm. shape the lens through which we see and experience the world and ourselves in it. And that's why, you know, like you and I could be in the exact same room in the exact same situation and have two very different experiences because we have very different lenses through which we are experiencing the world, right? Right. So right. this is part of, you know, I, this all contributes to the moral injury that people feel or any of the other occupational traumas. There's part of your workforce that is not going to have these issues, but then there's mm -hmm. a, a pretty significant part, I'm going to guess, right. that are having these issues and not talking about it because the culture mm -hmm. is not there to where they feel comfortable doing so. Mm -hmm. It's, it's interesting you say that. And I think that that shows up probably in so many areas of our life I, I, in different workplaces, not even related to this kind of, you know, mental health crisis that we're dealing with in this particular context. But even in other contexts, I remember just people feeling alone, like maybe I'm not cut up for this job. Maybe I'm not smart enough. Maybe I'm not healthy enough. Maybe I'm not strong enough. And if you don't see other people talking about it, you assume you're alone. So then you, well, I don't want to speak up because then I'm kind of outing myself as insufficient or inadequate in some way. Right. And mm -hmm. kind of how do you normalize the um, common like, um, just experiences of employees, whether they're new employees or, you know, the shock of, you know, the work that they're doing or how to handle it and just kind of normalizing some of those things is I think something that all employers should take into consideration, but especially those that are dealing with, um, you know, services they're offering that are clearly going to have an impact on people uh, and normalizing that a bit. And I think onboarding is a great spot. I I've, I've learned from my own um, experience that, um, you know, oh yeah, you know, six months later, I see this person's really struggling. And then I said, oh, you know what? I, I had this conversation recently every single person in your role starts this way and feels this way. Mind blown. This person, right? like, wait, <laughs> you've, you've had this conversation. I said, Oh, I've had this conversation with every single person I've hired in your role. Uh, and it, the huge sense of relief you could see in this person, like I thought I was the only one, um, just that validation and that support and creating yeah. that. And, and in hindsight, I took away from that. I need to be having this conversation day one or maybe not. <laughs> Maybe day one, repeat it again, like day 30, repeat exactly. it again, day 60, because that's just, that's needed, especially when it comes to mental health, especially some of these things that you're talking about. Um, yeah. Th I think that's amazing. Um, I, I am curious, you have this concept of organizations being traumatized or becoming traumatized. Tell me about that. That's an interesting concept. <laughs> 
Yeah, so um, this is actually, this has been around for a little while. Again, it's something that most people don't know about. But, um, you know, just like we as individuals can experience wounds, right, mm -hmm. through our trauma, so too can organizations. And that happens through our systems, right? So this is mm -hmm. uh, about uh, traumatizing our systems. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of describe it as the water that we're swimming in, right? So there's this mm -hmm. anecdote about um, two fishes swimming along and another fish swims by and says, oh, mm -hmm. hey, boys, how's the water today? And the two fishes kind of keep swimming along. And then one looks at the other and says, uh, what the heck is water, right? <laughs> and so right. it's this idea that we're so collectively, we're so focused on addressing um, you know, the overwhelming needs of the mission, because there are so many of them, mm -hmm. that we stop noticing when things aren't right within the organization itself. And, and it mm -hmm. becomes so, over time, it just becomes so normalized. Mm -hmm. And so this um, cumulative impact of it keeps building and building becomes trauma that just gets woven into the fabric of our culture. And it ultimately, mm -hmm. it just becomes the norm. And so like the water that we swim in, and we just stop noticing it anymore, even though it it's, you know, I, I really think org trauma is um, the root of things like moral injury, things like compassion mm -hmm. fatigue. Because if we're not having those conversations, if we're not supporting our workforce, if we're not stopping to evaluate the systems that we're creating, and if you think mm -hmm. about it, systems you know, I hear a lot about, oh, the system's broken, the system's broken. The system is sure. not broken. Systems are doing exactly what they were designed to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing we have to think about is that it's the people who have designed the systems, right? And many of them, mm -hmm. again, they're bringing the lens through which they experience the world into building mm -hmm. that system. So whatever trauma is coming in with them is getting built into that system mm -hmm. and is now becoming the way that we operate as a collective unit. And that can be a problem. And so that's why it's important to, you know, um, evaluate, like, where are we really? Like, where, yeah. what are, what are our systems doing? Are they working? How are they not impacting people the way that we want them to? Um, yeah. And involving uh, other people in this discussion, right? So having right. a good cross section of people who have um, diverse views and opinions and backgrounds so that we're getting all these different perspectives to figure out how do we build a system that is sustainable for all of us and that mm -hmm. encourages this connection and belonging that we need to feel safe in our work and in our lives and everything mm -hmm. else, right? And so, yeah. um, and there's so many things that contribute to creating organizational trauma. So a lack of transparency in communication and decision-making, this is a big mm -hmm. one, right? We got mm -hmm. a lot of top-down decisions <laughs> being made. And granted, there are there are times, right, where as a leader, I, I have to make some choices. Right. Um, but, you know, giving people an understanding of why the decision was made goes a really long way. Otherwise, we end up in these spaces where people are just speculating, they're gossiping um, about motives right. and choices and why things were done, right? Right, right. yep. And then um, perceptions or actual reality of racial, social, or other inequities in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So organizational trauma is very deeply tied to um, all these like, you know, I, I these diversity, equity, inclusion, um, things that people are doing oftentimes I just I have to shake my head because <laughs> a lot of times for me it feels very much like it's just we're checking off the box we're trying to do what we need oh to, to satisfy you know whoever yeah. but there's you have to heal the root issues in order to mm -hmm. really and, it, and I always say it's not just diversity equity inclusion it's you have to have the belonging in there, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, inclusion is like, uh, yeah, we're going to open the door and invite you in. Mm -hmm. But if you don't feel and, and give you a seat at the table, yeah. but if you don't feel like you belong at the table, mm -hmm. it's, you know, you're there, but you're not actually part of affecting any change. And so we want to do what we can to create those spaces of belonging as well. And so there's a lot of things like that um, that contribute um, to creating organizational trauma. Uh, everything you just said around, you know, this idea of organizational trauma, the transparency, the 
<laughs> the DEI checking the box. It's a, it's a hyper buzzword right now. Um, I feel like I'm constantly saying that around here. I always say, you know, it, it, we have like quarterly meetings here where I specifically say, these are all the things we're set out to do next quarter. This is what we didn't do. You're going to hear the words straight from my mouth because, and I tell people, they ask me, why do you, why are you so transparent about that? Why do you share that? Because in the absence of that, people have to make assumptions about their exactly. world. <laughs> they just exactly. have to. And typically um, the assumptions are not in my favor, nor are they accurate entirely. Right. Let me give some context. Maybe they're a little accurate, but let me get some context and that changes that changes the reality for people. And every other place I've ever worked, it's a very kind of secretive, you know, we can't, you know, these people are too fragile, or they don't understand whatever the assumptions were that, you know, we just couldn't be transparent about what we're doing, or the direction we're heading. You said something that I think is incredible. I, I like your idea of like DEI, not just checking a box and, and really being inclusive about it. But the word belonging, um, I think that's taking it to the next level. For people that have not considered this or just a question whether hmm, am I creating a space for belonging? What would you say that actually looks like in practice? Like what is the difference between inviting someone in and just being a little hospitable or giving you a seat at the table versus creating a space where people feel like they're belonging? Obviously it's a little individualized, but I'm yeah, that's I'm a great curious question. to hear from your perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as human beings, we are hardwired for connection um, and belonging. And so mm -hmm, what that yeah. means is, you know, when we think about our prehistoric ancestors, you know, they were out in the world and there was this feeling that if I get separated from my tribe or if I get um, sent away from my tribe, that I am not going to survive. And so that oldest part of our brain still associates that with, um, you know, so when we don't feel like we fit in, the brain mm -hmm. is thinking death, 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 <laughs> even sure. though, you know, maybe we are not necessarily thinking that extreme, but like, that's what's happening. And that's why we have all these kind of nervous system reactions, right? And mm -hmm. we go into fight or flight mode, things like that. And so when we talk about creating cultures of belonging, we always couple that with create creating cultures of connection and belonging. Mm -hmm. And so we want to create spaces where, um, you know, we we talk about this idea of trust and psychological safety, right? So psychological mm -hmm. safety is where you can be in this workspace and um, and you trust that you're able to speak your mind, you're able to say what you really think about something, mm -hmm. and that you're not going to be looked down on, you're not going to be penalized yeah. for it, you're not going to be judged for it. And let's mm -hmm. be honest, like we're human beings, we are always going to judge, right? Um, yeah. But do we have something in place where we are, um, you know, working with our staff to understand and notice that judgment? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe like, uh, dig into what where that judgment is coming from but like we don't right. want to just um we don't want to make like, like going back to your thing about assumptions right like it's true like our brain does not like not knowing and so right when that when when we don't have enough information it's going to start making up information to fill in that blank that's exactly. why we have all those assumptions right so mm -hmm. so belonging really looks like you know um uh, a leader coming into the room and not giving their opinion first, mm -hmm. but letting everyone around the table speak first um, mm -hmm. so that they're not like tainting, you know, what's happening. Yep. It's yep. about, um, you know, acknowledging when we, and again, a lot of this sits with leaders because what I have found, so I talk a lot about human centered leadership, right? Like mm -hmm. I have found that we as leaders often feel like, oh, I have to know everything. I can't show mm -hmm. any vulnerability. I can't show that I don't know something. Mm -hmm. And so belonging is created when, um, you know, when, uh, when, so we talk about cultures and we talk about climate. So climate is, is how I feel, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's the things that we do, but then there's the things that we feel. Mm -hmm. And so if I feel like I belong, I feel like I, um, I'm equal to the people around me. I, regardless right. of what my position is, I yeah. feel like I feel like I am seen, that I am heard, and that I have a voice in this organization, um, yeah. and that I'm respected for that. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean everyone has to take my ideas, but I feel like I am a part of this thing and not just, um, you know, this worker bee who's expected to to meet these metrics or whatever. And so, 
a lot of times it feels like, oh, we don't have time for this. We don't have time to establish connection. Right. We don't have time. You know, we, we need to get this work done. But right. I think it's short sighted because if we give people the time to connect on right. that level. So even, you know, within teams doing things, taking I talk about this idea of um like three minute story circles in the book mm -hmm. where, you know, if we allow people to connect um, for as little as three minutes at the beginning of a meeting about like yep. a particular theme or a question or whatever, we start to get to know each other beyond mm -hmm. just that, you know, work persona. And mm -hmm. what happens is the more that we do these kinds of things to build this kind of connection and belonging, what ends up happening is that when we encounter um, a major challenge like the pandemic, for example, Mm -hmm. um, those teams are already a tight unit. They're going to work yeah. through it. They're going to support each other um, to move their way through crisis and trauma together. Yeah. Unlike other teams where everyone is kind of trying to do it on their own and trying and, mm -hmm. and now organizations are like, oh, scrambling to try to figure out like, okay, how do we, how do we do this? But it's so much harder at that point because you don't have that trust already there. So absolutely, that's, that's a little bit about what I, I think about when I think about belonging. I love that when I, I, when I, I do orientation for all of our new employees and when we talk about, you know, inclusion and DEI, I say, I don't look at that in the traditional sense. I look at it as you are an individual, you have individualism, you're respected for that. You know, people respect you for your quirks and your like idiosyncrasies and you are who you are. You're not judged for it. It's kind of embraced. We might give you, a, we might teach you a little bit for, you know, some of the things like you can never show up to a meeting on time and you can do, you know, yeah. but it's really, you can show up unapologetically who you are. People know who you are. You don't feel like you need to fit into a mold or hold back or all of these things. So, so I love hearing that. Yeah. Um I, I feel like we can go on and on and on about all these things, but you have so many great things in your book and your content and, and all of these things. I'm curious about um, one other thing as it relates to kind of pivoting a little bit, but I'm also really fascinated again as an employer and somebody else that's um, kind of um, battled this through being an administrator and an employee. I want to talk a little bit about like a generational trauma, stuff that people kind of bring in with them and how that is typically a personal issue, but I, this could apply to any employer, right? In any, any profession, right? And how do mm -hmm. you bring that into the workplace? How do you advise leaders to support that? And, and I'll, and I'll add with like, because I always have to ask three questions at once. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. But okay. I'm really sometimes conflicted because and you probably know this, it's like the people person in me, the empath that I am, um, a person that's done a lot of work on my own and spent most of my adult life in therapy and, and, and kind of being aware of myself. And so therefore, I think I'm better at understanding other people. But then you have all of like the legal mumbo jumbo of like, you know, should you talk about these things as an employer? How do you show up for your employees? My employment law attorney would be like, what are you doing? You don't have conversations about your mental health with your, you know, employees or vice versa. And that can expose, you know, that's where things just unfortunately get so muddy and mm -hmm. you probably don't have the answer to that, but I'm always up for exploring how do we lean in as, a, as leaders of organizations to benefit or just show up and support our employees in all of those different complexities is very hard. So yeah. I'd love to hear any of your thoughts on that for people that are listening or having to battle this like I am. I think that's such a fair question, right? I'm I'm an attorney by training, so mm -hmm. I mean, we that's are why all I had about, to ask you yeah. that. You mentioned that. I was like, uh, maybe I could throw this in. That's a wild card. We were not yeah. planning on that, but that's okay. Yeah. So you know, so liability is always going to be an issue. You know, you don't want to bring up mental health if you are not equipped to deal with it. However, having right. said that, we know that mental health is one of the biggest issues facing. Um, you know, people in the workforce, especially post COVID, right? Like there's mm -hmm. so much collective grief that wasn't really addressed. Yeah. There was isolation and loneliness and, you right. know, so many things that people were dealing with that never really got addressed. And then there was also this idea of languishing. Languishing came out mm -hmm. of, um, out of COVID, which is, you know, where you're not quite depressed because you're still like able to do stuff, but you're not quite, you know, on that 
scale of are you not like quite flourishing you know so like it's this weird place where you're just kind of stuck and going through the motions and stuff and so these are all very real things that people are experiencing and so if your organization doesn't have people within the organization to address these things it's really important to partner with people mm -hmm. who bring that expertise but i think the thing that's important here is the acknowledgement of it, right? Mm -hmm. If you acknowledge to your staff, like, hey, we know that these are issues that you're contending with on top of the stress of the work and, and everything else, just even that acknowledgement goes a really, really long way. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece of this that I think is really important. So when I talk about creating a holistic human-centered duty of care, it is because I really think we need to look at the whole person, right? Mm -hmm. And looking at the whole person means that, um, so I, I I talk a lot about, you know, um, going from metrics-driven cultures to human-centered cultures. And um, we need metrics. That's the bottom mm -hmm. line, right? Like we, sure. we go to work to work. We need metrics to help us measure, you know, if we're hitting the, the targets that we need to, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. However, when metrics are the only driving force behind policies that are made and how we make decisions, that's where I think there's a problem. And so um, another way of, of bringing mental health into the workplace is building it into our decision-making um, practices so that mm -hmm. when we are setting things like workloads or when we are you know, determining how many people do we need for this project, we're factoring in what are the health and well-being consequences of this work? And what do we need to keep in mind when we are determining what our metrics should be? So like, I think those things need to work together in organizations. Mm -hmm. And that's one way yeah. that we can um, address some of these issues yeah. and, and not focus necessarily on like the liability of, oh, well, I'm not a mental right. health counselor and, right. and work is not time for therapy. Nobody's saying work is time for <laughs> therapy. Like I, I don't want you to, I don't want to go to therapy at work. You know, like mm -hmm. I, I, and that's the thing. Most people who get up in the morning, nobody's waking up and stretching and saying, oh my gosh, I'm going to go out into the world today and just be mediocre. Like, right, like right, most right. people genuinely want to do a good job. And if you give mm -hmm. them the tools and the, the scaffolding to support mm -hmm. them, they will do more for you. Right. And that and that's the other thing, right? All of these mm -hmm. things, of course, are an investment, but mm -hmm. putting this investment in is going to yield you so much more in the in the way of uh, employee retention. Like you're going to mm -hmm. keep people a lot longer. And I think sometimes people don't think about this, but right now we have such a revolving door in a lot of organizations, especially in these kind of helping professions where people are like, I'm I'm done, you know, mm -hmm. that you're spending so much money training new people and they're not staying even barely a year. And mm -hmm. if you could have people stay for three to five years, right. And get, sorry, I hate using the term return on investment, but that's what it is. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, so, so investing in that, and then you also start to build institutional knowledge. And the right. reason institutional knowledge is important is because in a lot of these things where we're dealing with other human beings, there is an element of confidence that has mm -hmm. to be there when you have to make a decision that impacts the life of another human. And mm -hmm. if you don't have that institutional knowledge, if you don't have like that experience behind you, you're brand new, you're not going to mm -hmm. have that confidence. It's going to take you right. longer to make decisions sure. or you're not going to make decisions. You're going to push them mm -hmm. off on somebody else. And so this <laughs> is where people end up spending a lot more money without realizing it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if these things are baked into how we're doing our work um, or in how we're making decisions, creating policies, creating procedures, um, we can actually see a shift happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, um, I know I've already taken up more time than I was allowed to, but I love, I, I love what you're talking about institutional knowledge. You know, this month is the eighth anniversary of my firm. And we talk about this a lot. And I'm sure many other people that have young organizations, whether for profit, nonprofit, whichever, the value of having people stick around for a period of time and as the leader of that organization going from having to have your hands involved in everything and decisions involved in everything my business partner and i talk all the time about we don't have enough institutional knowledge here we don't and now 
as we progress and, you know, we mature, I guess is a better word and having people that, as you said, have the confidence to deal with the client confrontations or conflicts, like dealing with staffing challenges, dealing with all of these things that all businesses have together. It just goes back to show what can we do for, I mean, it really goes back to staff retention, as you mentioned, staff satisfaction, staff retention and all of the things. So I think you've given us so much to think about. And I, I know I sit on a board for um, an organization that does suicide prevention for school age kids. And I know that these professionals are going out there dealing with a lot of the things that you're talking about. And it, it's interesting for me to go back and at least reflect on in my life, whether it's the work that I do in my organization or work organizations that I serve with in a volunteer capacity on how to bake in more of this duty of care, as you've called it for, um, for the individuals that are doing this work. But can I just add one, one thing? Please do. Yes. It's been a great (laughs) conversation. I don't want to rush it, but I want to be respectful too. (laughs) No, I appreciate that. I just want to say that, uh, you know, I, I, I know we have to make a business case for these things. There's a part of me that wishes that we could say duty of care because it's the right thing to do. right? Right. But at the end of the day for business owners and, um, organizations, they want to know, like, how does this impact my bottom line? So there is that business mm-hmm. case. And the other reality is that, you know, yes, we want to retain people, but we also know that we're not like, you know, the baby boomers and even a lot of us from Gen X, we um, we may have stayed in jobs for much longer, right? Mm-hmm. Like baby boomers stayed in jobs for 30, 40, 50 years, right? Sure. But like, um, but the newer generations that are coming up, they're they're not necessarily tied to any one ge- um, right. job. And so three to five years is really a good like shelf life for a particular job. And that's mm-hmm. where we say like five years is the point at which we start to become so proficient that we start to get bored and we lose mm-hmm. that sense of purpose. And so this is like a good thing to aim for with the idea that we're always trying to help our people develop sure. and move on to bigger and better things, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, so, so kind of just keeping that in mind, I think. But, um, but yeah, yeah, I'd love to see organizations do this because it is the right thing to do for their people. Well, it's... Yeah, it's interesting, too, because I'm, you know, the treasurer, and I have to deal with the budgets and all that. And oftentimes, we talk about, you know, the risk of losing individuals. I'm mostly talking about mental health professionals, therapists, specifically, right, or um, educators working in early childhood, or or other schools, especially schools that are under resourced. And um, I think a lot of times, especially in the mental health space, we think that people are leaving for private practice, because that's more desirable, maybe for many people it is, I don't know, but maybe part of it is um, our unwillingness to deal with some of this occupational trauma and, and yeah. th- that we've been talking about. And if organizations focus less on, you know, okay, well, we just need to meet competitive salaries. I mean, yes, that matters, but I, I think we just assume, well, we just need to keep raising um, salaries. We need to keep raising salaries. And, and I don't want to discount like inflation, the cost of living and all those sorts sure, of things, sure. but I think we're really probably um, underestimating the um, the motivation to leave a job because of some of this unresolved trauma. And and I know I have um, friends that decided to go into the mental health space. Um, they're a licensed therapist, and they've decided to get out of that space just simply because it's just too much. And mm-hmm. and so a lot of what you know you shared today certainly speaks with me. I know will certainly speak with some of our leaders and. I know people have lots of follow-up questions and, you know, as you have on your screen, for those that are not watching, um, (laughs) that are listening to this, um, Dibble, do you want to share a little bit more about how people can contact you? And I definitely want to highlight, you are an author of a book that's getting released in February, 2024. I'd love to know where people can find that. If you can share some of that information and we'll add it to our show notes as well. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, my book is tell me my story, challenging the, um, challenging the narrative of service before self sorry Mm -hmm. um it launches february 21st it is available for pre-order right now at all major online retailers um and i am currently looking um i've started putting together book events so if you um uh, so for the listeners if you or you know somebody who is interested Mm -hmm. in having me come and do uh i'm doing i'm what i'm calling a series of fireside chats and so it's an opportunity to kind of talk to people about some of the themes in the book and um and dive deeper kind of like we just did 
Um, and then I've also got a couple of human-centered leadership podcasts. So there's uh, the limited series one I mentioned, Service Without Sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I also have another one called What Would Ted Lasso Do? And so that mm -hmm. one, we go through all the episodes of Ted Lasso through the lens of leadership and positive psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and then for more information about me or my work, um, you can go to my website, which is um, Roots in the Clouds, and that's plural, uh, dot com. Mm -hmm. And also you can follow me on uh, social media at Dim Story across most major platforms and also um, on Substack at Dear Humanitarian. So lots of ways to connect with you. So yeah. that's, thank you again, Jumble, for all of your time. I appreciate that. Uh, and for everybody listening, don't forget to engage in this conversation in some way, whether you're listening, like, review, share, whatever. If you're on YouTube and you're watching the video, same way, the more that you engage with content, you all know how this works, the more that it becomes visible and accessible for other people that might find this content helpful. So thank you all so much. And we'll see you next time. That's all we have for you today. Once again, I'm Tasha Anderson with the Charity CFO, and this is a modern nonprofit podcast. Make sure to subscribe to A Modern Nonprofit Podcast on all major streaming platforms so you will stay notified for when the latest episode drops, which will help you stay in the know about anything nonprofit related. Also, join our community on Facebook by searching for A Modern Nonprofit Podcast and follow us on all of our social media accounts. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.